kids to have the experience of knowing that the world isn't magic and mystery, that you can actually make changes to it yourself. But we're not there yet. We can change this. And you, yes, you, the inspired people who have stayed here this late in the day <laughs> to learn about teaching kids to code. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why we're doing it, how to go about it, and some places that you can join in with others to teach kids to code. First, why? I'm not going to say much about this because I think we have the choir here. Mm. But I want to share a few appalling statistics, some of my favorite appalling statistics. This one from a couple of years back that looked at the Minnesota state standards and compared them to the 49 other state standards in computer science specifically and placed us, number 47, that's three from the bottom in our um, Minnesota state standards on computer science. Another set of statistics that I just um, looked at this week, every year we, we have about 80,000 18-year-olds that are of the right age to graduate from high school. Only about 79% of them actually do graduate, which is another issue. In Minneapolis, it's only about 54% graduate. So that's a major societal issue. But if we look just at the ones who do graduate, that's about 63 thousand kids, 70% of them are college bound, and about two-thirds of them take the AP exam. So we have 37,364 kids who take AP college placement exam. Any guesses on how many of those take the computer science test? Five, 240? You're all a little low, actually. It's 251 students <laughs> in Minnesota. That's, oh, this isn't showing up very well. This is a pie chart here, and that sliver <laughs> is the percentage of students who are taking the advanced placement test in computer science. Now, that's just one measure, but I wanted to explore that 2% a little more. Um, of those 251 students, Three of them were black, three of them were Latino, two of them were American Indian. Do I want to allow that? No way, not today. No. Um, don't do Windows 8. I'm still sorry. Anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with teaching kids to code. But. Um, so we're doing lousy with certain ethnic groups. How do you think we're doing with women? Any guesses? 251 kids, how many are young women? 22? Not even 10%. We're not doing so good. <laughs> okay, so that, those and many other appalling statistics are part of the reason that I um, founded Code Savvy and tried to um, coerce or inspire as many people as I can to work on this problem with us. I also want to mention um, an organization called, this isn't the right version of this, anyhow, an organization called Code.org um, that has been a real catalyst in inspiring a lot of people to be interested in coding. They did the hour of code thing where they said, you know, we're going to have a million people learn to code, and, and they did it. Actually, they have at this moment 32 million people not counting dupes, and I myself am about 30 of them. Um, not counting dupes, but it's, I think, about 30-some million people having written 1.5 billion lines of code. Now, some of these aren't real codey lines of code, but anyhow, um, Code.org is doing good work, including inspiring our um, president to give a speech about how everybody should learn computer science. Now, he's not talking about how you should learn English literature or history, all of which are also important. But So high profile, 2014, we are kind of at the tipping point of computer education. Um, but the tipping point doesn't actually look like this. It kind of looks like that. You know, we've had very, very little, and we're about to hit that steep slope. Um, so here we are to figure out how to do that. Um, that's all you're going to get for why. Um, 
Let's talk about a few places that you can do this. Last year at Minibar, Matt Gray and I gave a talk about, hey, we want to start a coder dojo. Anybody want to help us? That was a year ago. Um, since then, not only has Coder Dojo served over 2,000 kids and started four other Coder Dojos, but we have a whole variety, a whole ecosystem of different coding projects. Bunch of them are targeting girls and young women. Just because, hey, when I started coding 40 years ago, it was about more than a third women, and now it's less than 10%. That's not progress. We're missing out on brain power, and we're missing out on other things that we can invent that aren't being invented. Another focus of Code Savvy is making sure that different communities that aren't currently well represented become well represented. These are not the three kids who took the AP test. These are three kids. The, um, these are three kids we're hoping will take the AP test in the future. Also, I just wanted to say we just put the registration up for Code Camps. Um, so Coder Dojo. That um, picture back there. Oops, not going to do that. Um, the Original Coder Dojo picture on the previous slide was from the South, Minneapolis, South Minnesota Coder Dojo in Rochester. This one is from the Coder Dojo that meets um, at the University of Minnesota about every other week. We have uh, about 100 kids we serve each week, a little less, and we have today 178 on the wait list. It's usually almost that bad. It's a little worse because a lot of us are at Minibar today. <laughs> but, um, so Coder Dojo is a global movement that started in Ireland a couple of years back. It is free, it is open, it is child-led and volunteer-run. The one rule is be cool, which doesn't mean you have to change your um, attire. It means that you're in there for high quality. There's no bullying. Everybody helps each other. Coder Dojo started a year ago tomorrow. It's our anniversary. We have welcomed over 2,000 kids. We have eight different code groups and keep a ratio of no more than one mentor for every three kids. So it's a lot, it's, it's like coaching. I mean, it's like, it's like a sport. Um, here's three other, four other um, coder dojos that have started in Minnesota. We've also had delegations from as far as Nebraska come to look at the Twin Cities Coder Dojo because it's great. Yeah? Is the Katie Dojo one, is that because it's just the same name? It is at St. Kate's. It is at St. Kate's, and they didn't want to call it Girly Coder Dojo or Young Women Coder Dojo, so they called it St. Kate's. Oh, good, great. Come, come mentor there. Okay. It, um, that one's meeting like once a month. It is not meeting in April, but we have a robot program at the University of Minnesota for April. They're more limited in size and much more structured than the Twin Cities Coder Dojo, but Coder Dojos differ, differ. Each one is different. The only thing is you can't charge and you have to be cool. Um, so, girls, girls stuff. Um, we have several programs. Um, that picture, which was taken by Matt Johnson, was from um, a program called Technovation Minnesota, which was is um, bringing something called the Technovation Challenge, a global challenge to Minnesota. Girls spend 12 very intensive weeks learning how to design build, pitch, and plan to commercialize mobile apps. Um, many of them use App Inventor, which is a nice, easy to use program. Um, but you, you don't have to. You can, do, you can do anything. Most of the sites are at schools. We have 18 teams started in Minnesota, and 11 are making it to the um, final party, which is called Appapalooza. It is on Sunday. April 27th, and it's a great party. If you want to encourage young women in technology and come to a great party, we have giant balloons, a photo booth, yummy desserts, a DJ, and all the girls making their pitches in public. It's free. Go to codesavvy.org, and there's registration material, or better yet, go to technovationmin.org, mn.org. Um, just a quick pitch for a little fun thing next weekend. If um, you know, teenage girls who aren't doing anything next Saturday, they can come and program robots at the U, um, Katie Coder Dojo. Um, we're doing Girl Scout events, and in the future we want to do adult women, but we haven't started yet. You're welcome to come and sit down if you want to. I mean, it's, you know, it's minibar, we're casual here. 
Um, or you can creep around back if you want to be discreet. There's a lot of it. Anyhow, um, Northside, meaning North Minneapolis, is one of many communities in Minnesota that are not very well represented. So we're doing several different projects on the north side, both because the north side really needs it and because we want to like create a model that works of what actually happens. So um, Cotevi is in par partnering with a place called the Digital Empowerment Academy. This is their second year. And they take a bunch of teenagers that a lot of them don't even have computers at home. And they lend them iPads, and we give them desktops, and they learn all kinds of things that they can use to publicize and promote a social justice issue of their choosing. Um, and then they learn to code, too. And in order to earn their computers, they have to volunteer to teach other kids to code. So we're trying to start like this whole networky thing, including um, at the Sumner Library, a Northside Code Club, which we did a three-week trial. It is just a hoot. We've got like this room full of Somali kids and Hmong kids and African American. It's just, and they're all so into it, they hardly ever look up until it's snack time. Um, the North Side is also uh, in um, collaboration with UROC, which is the University Research Oper whatever, University of Minnesota stuff in North Minneapolis. We're doing a whole digital innovation forum trying to answer the question that every community should be answering, which is like, how do we start our kids in on this and create um, kids who are going to create the future? Um, again, there's information on that on um, the codesavvy.org website. Savvy has two Vs, and I apologize that you can't actually reach it on your smartphones right now because I made some kind of mistake in Anyhow, I'll, it will be fixed. Um, code camps. Oh, I'm sorry, this one doesn't show up better. It's a little light. This is a kid at Coder Dojo who was programming in Scratch, and he found this animation of the cat flushing a toilet, and the water was spinning around. He wanted the water to like splash up, so he got into this whole trajectory. Anyhow, great kid. Um, but we're offering four or five or six camps at Leonardo's Basement. How many people have heard of Leonardo's Basement? Excellent. Anyhow, we thought it was a good stimulating environment, so we're doing code camps there, um, taught by brilliant, caring teachers. Um, I highly recommend them. It's, this is the only program that we're actually charging for, and there is a sliding fee scale if need be. We're also beginning to do some work with educators, including <laughs> Kirsten Reed, to, um, to teach your teachers how to teach, you know, because that's where we're headed. We're not there yet, but when the educators catch up, we're like there for them. So this is the logo that's going to go on the t-shirts for our teacher workshops. The committee of teachers chose this. I thought it was a little, you know, get with the program, but they loved it. So um, anyhow, that's how to get a hold of me and Code Savvy, but now I'm going to get into the good um, how do you do this? But first, I need to know a little bit about you. How many of you actually program for a living, like that's what you do? Yes, I want you. We need you. Um, how many of you don't program for a living, but you, you know, you've programmed, you know how, how this works? Most of you. How many are like here because we care about this, but we're not necessarily there? Excellent. Hey, you don't count. You program. Um, okay. Of, of the people that have programmed, I want to know how many of you learned before you were 10 years old? Okay, before 15? Keep your hands up. Before, how many of you did not learn until you were in college? Cool, okay. Um, one of the reasons that it's sometimes difficult for um, techies to teach what we're doing is because we learned it ourselves, you know, just kind of in our dark closets or those basements that they used to keep those big computers in. Um, so it's hard to figure out like how to teach somebody something. And part of the answer is we're not really trying to teach kids how to code. We're trying to help them learn how to code and learn how to learn how to code. Um, so part of um, teaching kids to code is creating a good environment for this, an environment where the it's project-based, so kids are actually making something. This is my favorite slide, actually. Um, 
It's project-based, so they're making something that's meaningful to them. It's driven by their own interests. Um, they have some time to like mess around with it because you learn a whole lot by messing around and sociologists who have studied this are very big on messing around with technology. They're experiencing real world problem solving, which is a fantastic thing to know. They have mentors, <laughs> please, um, who both help them and encourage them. And this encouragement part is actually critically important because many kids don't know that it's okay to fail. In fact, we fail all the time. I mean, daily, every minute, you know, and you fail and then you fail better and then you figure out how to do it and then, then there you are. So having an adult who's not related them, to them who's saying, yes, yes, you could do it. Just try that one thing again. You know, what could you try next? That's really important. Okay, so that's the environment. The next thing is kind of my, I mean, this stuff changes all the time, but this is my current list of what I think kids should learn in approximately the order. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about some surrounding directions. Um, one of the directions is stuff. You know, it could be an Arduino, it could be sensors, it could be lily pads if you want to light up your clothing, it could be robots. Many kids relate to this stuff better when there's some real world tangible thing that's moving around or showing them. So that's often a great entree or a great sideline. Coder Dojo, for instance, has a session using Arduinos. Um, another thing that uh, many beginners don't get is the whole systemic, systemic surroundings. You know, they, they go on Code Academy, they learn all the syntax stuff, they learn algorithms, you know, they can write sort algorithms, but they don't have any idea when they leave the bubble of these learning environments, like, what's a code editor and what does it do for you? And it's like, wow, code editors are fantastic. You know, what's an IDE, what does it even mean? You know, and what's there besides a code editor and an IDE? You know, what's an API, what's version control, you know, all of this stuff. Um, I can't say it separates the men from the boys. That's, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you say? I mean, it, it's like terrifying when you go outside the bubble and suddenly you have to do version control, you have to do command line stuff. This is something that should be included when we're teaching beginners too, just so that they know they can do this in the real world. Anyhow. The, the other direction is there are a lot of ways beyond the few languages that I'm going to talk about that you can go deeper. If you're learning JavaScript, you should learn all the, X, the, the alphabet soup.js stuff that's out there from Node.js to AngularJS to Mustache. You know, I don't even know what all those things are. But um, there's, you know, beyond that, there's a lot deeper and further that you can get. But anyhow, this is my handful of. Um, Favorites. First off, Scratch. How many have tried Scratch out? Okay. How many of you have a kid that you're either teaching of your own or the neighbors or the you know you're mentoring with us? Oh, cool. So some of you are, are into this. Anyhow, Scratch is totally the best place to start. Um, it's block oriented, so you're just dragging these things over. You can design things yourself. You can make. Um, Animation, you can make games, you can make, you can tell stories, you can make art. It's free, um, scratch.mit.edu. It is, has got oodles and oodles of, you know, little cards that you can learn from or, you know, ways to go through it. Um, I like it because unlike, for instance, a bunch of the stuff on code.org, you're learning how to program by actually programming. <laughs> You're not like playing a game or doing a maze or something that's going to teach you how to do do loops. You're doing do loops because you want your little bird to keep flapping its wings and move. Or you're learning about variables because you want to keep score in your game. I mean, it's project based. You're actually making something. You're, you're programming something new. Um, right. Plus, yeah. I really like it because it's like real programming language. Yes. Yeah. At which, uh, plus you don't have to know how to type or spell. You can, so, so it's easy entry, but it's, it's very powerful. And one of the things I love about, another thing I love about it is that you can look at what other kids do. Because they post it all over the place. And you can look in it, and you can, I, what did I touch? Uh, so you can look in it, you can remix it. 
You can find some cool animation that somebody did, and then you push the see inside button. And you know there's their code right there. And you can mess with it. You can change the numbers. You can change the little pictures. So it creates a very real world programmer kind of environment with a lot, without a lot of the frustration that exists in a real world programming environment. Yeah. Um, there's also Scratch Junior on Kickstarter right now that they're targeting for little kids. kids that are There's um, also kind of a grown-up version of Scratch, which is called Snap, which they use at University of, of California at Berkeley to teach non-computer science majors how to, how to program. Um, Scratch also has a lot of new features that allow you to interface to the real world, like sensors, so you can do a, um, you know, you can like pop the bubbles or play the piano with your own body, which is kind of cool. There's a bunch of other things coming out, hopscotch, that, that you can do similar things with young kids, but Scratch is my favorite, so I'm telling you about Scratch. My next step is App Inventor. Kids are just so excited about doing something on their phones. App Inventor looks like this, and I um, should have darkened it or something. Um, but this is the design screen. It's where you pull over all your buttons, all your pictures, all your sounds, all the stuff that you're going to make your program out of. This is a very simple program called Hello Purr, where you push the cat and it purrs. Or you can make a bark or a clock, or you can make your kid brother, you know, what, whatever. But that's where you put the elements on. And then the next screen looks kind of scratch-like that you're pulling over commands that actually do something. You test it out on a real phone. I mean, your phone's right there, and you make a change, and there it is on your phone. So it, it's um, real world. You can actually put App Inventor apps in the App Store. Um, it's powerful. You can connect to real world APIs. You know, you can put in a database or anything you want. Again, there's lots of resources. and. This is the program that a lot of the young women use in the Technovation Challenge. So we have whole bunches of mentors that are starting um, to learn App Inventor. Not going to talk much about the web because I assume that most of you know more about it than me. Um, but kids should, kids should play with the web. They're more interested in mobile now. But um, Mozilla Webmaker has pools of great resources, including the X-ray goggles. Most people in the world don't know that you can actually look at the code in almost, you know, anybody. I mean, you can, like, take somebody else's website and paint mustaches on all the models. I mean, you know, you can have fun. And most people don't know that they should be using real-world code editors. It's okay to start with blogging platforms, you know, just so kids get the idea that they can put their content out there. But sooner or later, they're going to want to look under the lid and get some real HTML and CSS and absolutely play with JavaScript. As I understand it, JavaScript has been rehabilitated in the last several years that it's no longer kind of a, you know, unwashed language. Um, but I forget what I put under JavaScript. Just that you should play it. I mean, you can, like, make things move around. The only thing I'm going to say about Ruby is if you love Ruby and want to teach kids Ruby, go to kidsruby.org. They have a wonderful environment um, that's easy to use. Um, and Python, I just have to mention this because Minecraft, you know. And they, before we had um, descriptions of the code groups at Coder Dojo, it's like every kid, especially all the 8 to 10 year old guys, wanted to know how to mod Minecraft. Um, so I wanted to say a few things about this, and, you know, I can send you my slides. I mean, it, I, you know, you can't click on the screen, but this is, first of all, you can just Google, you know, Python plus Minecraft and get a bunch of stuff. If you want to look at what Coder Dojo is doing, just look at the GitHub and that's the, um, the URL for it. We also have a couple of handouts that we pass out. If you're really into this, just email me and I'll send you the Coder Dojo handouts. They've all approved it. We started doing it with Raspberry Pis that turned out to be both not very robust and a real pain in the neck to drag over to the university because you had to drag over screens and stuff like that. So we're now doing it without a Pi, without the Raspberry Pi. It's actually a little trickier to do it on a real machine, but there's good ways to do it that involve something called Craft Book Kit. 
um, and raspberry juice, and that'll tell you all about it. Um, so kids in code, we talked about why, we talked about where, we talked about how. Now we're going to talk about what a little bit. And the what is what can you do, because I am shamelessly, fervently trying to encourage all of you to help with this. The ways you can help is you can mentor at one of those existing things. You can volunteer, because even if you're not technical, we need people to do non-technical things to make it work smoother than just the technical people would do. Um, Laptops, if you're updating your laptop, we could sure use them for a variety of programs. You can donate cash by pressing the donate button and channel it either to Code Savvy in general or to any of the individual programs. Or you, yes, you could start your own Coder Dojo. We need about 12 more in the Twin Cities. They're fun and easy to start if you go to coderdojo.org. Tells you all about it. You don't have to drive into the U on a Saturday. You know, start one wherever you live. We have a bunch of teenagers that are starting one in Minnetonka. Um, oh, another thing um, that I didn't put a slide in is something called Code Club. If you're in, Code Club is something out of Britain. You, it's, the URL is codeclubworld.org. And it's, if you want to teach coding, you don't know much about teaching coding, and you don't want to work too hard at it, it's like every week there's an hour-long lesson. It tells you exactly what to do. These things are kid tried and true. It starts with Scratch and does two semesters of Scratch. Um, then it moves on to Python, I believe. They're in their third year of development. They're going to keep adding a year so you can start, and they'll just take you all the way. Code Club. So it's a British organization. Anyhow, here's a bunch of local places that need mentors. Um, you can also go to codesavvy.org. Again, not on your cell phone right now. Uh, and there's a volunteer link that we list other things that need volunteers. Um, oh, there is the Code Club site. So um, they also have like these adorable robots that you can animate and make them dance. Anyhow. Very thoughtfully put together. I think it's a, a great program, and I would like to see it spread all over the Twin Cities and beyond. Um, donate. Those are just some places you can go and donate money. We don't need a whole lot of money, as it turns out. What we need mostly is mentors, but money is always good, and we usually use it to throw great parties like the Appapalooza or to provide machines for kids who don't have them, like at the um, Digital Empowerment Academy. Oh, we're tax exempt to um, 501c3 through Leonardo's basement. So if you need a big tax break, we're it. So we are here. We have that big slope to go up. Um, but we can do it. Drew, Drew Houston, who founded Dropbox, um, said coding is the closest thing we have to a superpower. That makes you all the closest thing we have to superheroes. We need you now, superheroes. You know why, you know where, you know how. So the final word from one of my heroes, Grace Hopper, who I actually met when I was a college student. Um, she's the greatest superhero of them all because she kind of invented coding. Anyhow, and her byline is, just do it. Don't ask permission. Don't wait until they approve it. Just do it. And by the time they notice, you'll have it working and they'll be pleased. So again, that's my contact information. I'm happy to take any questions or whatever. I went to end a little early because I thought I know it's late. Yeah. So I have a, a little kid. Uh, seven. Uh-huh. And she's asking about the software guide. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Bunch of cool robots. I mean, I would yeah. I would start her on Scratch. I mean, part of it, if it's, she's looking at what it looks like when you program, that's not as cool as, for instance, Scratch. Oh, yeah, we've done Scratch. But she's okay, you've done Scratch, and she doesn't get it. She doesn't like it. She doesn't like it. Yeah, Snap Surface is very cool.
Let it's a great platform. It's a little frustrating for a seven-year-old because there's a lot of stuff you have to do just to keep the Legos from falling apart. So I would, I would use something called a Finch robot or a B-bot, B-E-E-B-O-T. A B bot, B bots. You can just they, they cost about sixty bucks each, and they're only you know these cute little things. But you can program it through mazes just by pushing right on the bot, so you don't have to go into um, stuff. Wish I had a better answer. I will think about Maybe that. Rose, yeah. Can uh, you get her a soldering iron? She'll burn her fingers three times, and then Papa will be much more interested. <laughs> 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 Another idea. If you've got a kid that's, that's really into it, you may want to, instead of the snap circuits, which are kind of canned, go to Axman, get some motors, yeah. get some, um, yeah. get some um, alligator clips, get some batteries, and just, you know, some light bulbs, some motors, and, and let her loose with it, and just see what she builds. Down to the works yet, take her down to the works and show her the, the works. Oh, yeah. It's a museum down in Bloomington. And they also do, like, summer camps and day camps and my daughter has been to them and loved them. Thanks so much. I started the works 25 years ago, so I'm oh. happy to have people recommend the works. Science Museum and um, Leonardo's Basement have good stuff, too. Yeah, I was going to say, Leonardo's Basement has some yeah. really good summer spots and surfaces. Yeah, take her. Ba Bakken is fantastic. Science Museum has got some good stuff, too. Personally, I hate Goldie Blocks. No, I mean, no, no, I, I, just, I just have to say it. I mean, they've gotten, a, they've gotten a lot of good PR, but it's some plastic stuff that you should be doing with um, spools of thread and just elastic and stuff. And they colored it pink even. I mean, they have fantastic branding, fantastic right. ads. But it's like the stuff you should go to Axman and get just some real stuff to play. I mean, that, that's my, so, so, yeah. Did we did, look at Nord, um, Digital Empowerment Academy? Did we post it yet? I'm on the course that we chose. Oh, Lenise. Um, sorry, I will, I will get it up. We just hatched this with, with you, Rock, last week. So it, okay. it's, you're the first to know. Yeah. And we'd love to have you there. And if you want to help plan it, send me an email. I'm yeah, <laughs> Coder Dojo, Coder Dojo is just horrible. I mean, we always have a wait list that's twice as long as this. That's why I want you to all start Coder Dojos or come um, enter. Do you have boys or girls? I have two girls. Okay, go to Katie Coder Dojo. You can get in and go to this thing at the at the U next week with robots. There's dog room in that. They're posted. They're on the Leonardo's Basement website. Leonardo's Basement .org. They do cost money. It's like $185, but there's a sliding fee scale, so we're trying to be as open as we can. Chris. Arjun had a question with regards to Thank you. teaching like middle school kids the kind of between the web languages like JavaScript and Ruby versus compiled Java language. Mm -hmm. Deeper, you had yeah. you know, Java versus yeah. JavaScript. Uh, uh, JavaScript's the most fun, okay. and so you can go right into JavaScript. But they should also know that JavaScript is part of a web language. So if if you want to like take your cool thing that you made and actually pop it out there, right. okay. it's good to have. So HTML and CSS aren't as as fun for many kids to play with. A, little, a lot of kids get into the whole, you know, let's make it like really look good, and that's a fantastic job opportunity, too. For, for the gentleman that was looking for hardware opportunities, yeah. um, there's a company called LightUp, lightup.io, that um, really went into sort of like the chip capture idea, but you can get any system, augmented reality, where you can like phone over the circuit and then load them. Oh, fun.
with them yet. Do you hear, Tracy? Um, play with them and then post something on the, the website or write a blog for us. No, Tanya Bits is, is aimed just for that age. Um, and I, I've heard good things about it. I haven't personally tried it. Oh, another one, well, if they're into to coding stuff, is, um, is Hopscotch. It's really good. You and then you. Yeah. Oh, 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 to start another Coder Dojo. Yeah, you don't have to live in Bemidji or anything to do it. We could use one on every block. You know, it should be like the rec center. But I mean, is there like yes, yes, go to code, coderdojo.org, which is the global one. And what you get right there on their homepage is, you want to start a dojo? Great, here's how to do it. Step A with a darling video, step B with a darling video. And part of it is, Again, back to Grace Hopper, just do it. I mean, I cannot, t we, when we, um, we're starting it last year, we came to Mini Bar, we got about 20 mentors, they all got together. The technical brilliance was just palpable in that room, but they were very nervous about actual human children being in front of them <laughs> and what this was involved. You know, what, what if it hits somebody else or what if it needs to blow its nose or, you know, what do I do with it? So we, so we brought in some, some real um, teachers like Kirsten to kind of like loosen people up about that. And it turns out that in, um, you know, 29 sessions and 2,000 kids, there's been like no issues except one, which is a hilarious story in its own right. But, uh, <laughs> um, so, so try it. Start small. And then, then try it, and we're happy to help you. We'll help train your mentors, we'll come out, we'll talk, we'll, you know, whatever, whatever. we'll lend you our stuff. I mean, we're very interested in getting more Coder Dojos going. Yeah, we're from, uh, we're on the computer faculty down at South Central down in North Mankato. Cool, start and, one. And we've got more gals coming in, but they're on the software side. The problem is the jobs in Outstate are in... Are in manufacturing, yeah. Well, they're in yeah. The companies hire one person. They got to do hardware and software. So if your daughter wants to know hardware business, send her to us. But um, one of the things I was a little disappointed in in the last few years with all the STEM business is that the computer world has kind of been left out of that. It's the females that are floating around in southern Minnesota, it's biology, chemistry, physics. There's no computer stuff in there. It's kind of not so. I mean, the word STEM means math and science. But it, science, technology, and yeah, it's like where's the T and where's the E. So yeah. w with th those are those. That's my life work oh. with the, the works that got the E in, and now we're working. Yeah, so what we need, <laughs> what we need people to do is is when the kids are in middle their middle school and high school, get them into at least for us in the Outstate area some of the hardware type stuff. Before they that, start. They got to know how to code, but they also have to know how to troubleshoot a PC. Yeah. And kids love that. Kids love robots. They should start before middle school, too, because a, a lot of kids are just real palpable. So if you need any help, or in, I mean, well, we're, we're happy to. Yeah, good. Please, please, please do. I mean, you know, we're. I'm just curious, do you work still Laura Jeffrey School at all? You betcha. They're one of our technovation teams. We love Laura Jeffrey. They have one, two, three, three or four, four teams. teams, four teams. Oh, Shruti is the mentor of the, the those some of the groups. So she'll tell you all about it. And I think we're doing a summer camp at St. Paul City School that's in conjunction with Laura Jeffrey. So there's an all-girl fifth grade summer camp that we're doing, if I don't have the dates on that. Um, so La Laura Jeffrey's at a special place. Um, other questions or comments, or you're welcome to get up and leave at any time. I know it's late. Yeah. Yeah, OK. So, so I have two kids, uh, two boys, nine and four. And I'm, I'm very, my, uh, my older son in particular is on the computer all the time. He, uh -huh. he knows about coding, but he still spends most of his time playing games. Basically, I'm interested in getting him interested, and I take steps in that regard, but I don't think, I don't want to put the time and effort to, like, mentor at the dojo. Yeah, tr try Code Club. Try, I mean, they have... 
it's, it's like an hour a week and they just tell you, okay, this week you should be doing this, this week you should be doing this. So it's not one of those, you know, you're playing around with Scratch and you just can't figure out how to do this and like you have to figure it out. There, I, that's what I would try. Yeah, I, well, I, yeah, it, it's. But it's, also, you know, n nine years old is a wonderful age and a lot of them are in different places. So if he isn't like doing formal, constructive stuff, he's nine years old, you know, it's, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think what's most important at that age is exposure. Um, and also a little bit of cool factor. If he likes robots, you know, take him to the robot shows and stuff like that. Well, yeah, and if he likes any of the Minecraft mods, you know, he's like, yeah. I want to do like OEM stuff. And I'd be like, hey, you like gaming? Well, you can game. And he's like, oh, you like gaming? Well, you can game. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, he's into Minecraft. It's not his favorite, but he's into it. And we're on the server sometimes, and we can log into our server. So I, I don't, I mean, I have kind of a renegade view of young kids, I think, until they're at least six or eight years old. They should just be playing in dirt and making stuff out of cardboard and duct tape and, you know, forget all this abstract, but um, yeah, the sort of not the way they're... playing in dirt. They're, like, doing unconstructive things with iPads. Oh, oh, take away their iPads and give them duct tape and cardboard. <laughs> 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 and a hummingbird kit. Hummingbird is a, something sort of like Arduino that allows you to... Um, hook up sensors to your construction. So if you made like a dragon, you could, you know, program its wings to flap and its eyes to flash and stuff like that. Hummingbird, a really yeah. fantastic kit. Might be a little tough for a seven-year-old, uh, Christopher, but... Oh, it, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hummingbird, it's made by Carnegie Mellon, the same people who make the Finch robot, and it's, it's a fantastic kit. I, um, He, he was part of that. Um, Pausch was his yeah, name? Yeah, what's, what's the software called? Do you know? Does anybody know? Uh, it's like, it's a, a one-word name. Alice. Alice. Yeah. Is that still? Alice is still around. I per personally prefer Scratch okay. because it's a little easier to get into than Alice. And once you're ready for something like Alice, you could be doing something like App Inventor and putting it in your phone. So, okay. But Al Alice is a fantastic program. It's one of the earliest ones, and there's good stuff about it. It does not run on iPads, to my knowledge. There is an app, but if you're, if all, no, it'll do any browser, it does Linux. Yeah, it runs in the browser. Um, if you have an iPad, use Hopscotch is a good one for iPad. Is it? Okay, well, I'm, I'm not holding my breath, but. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah, that's a problem. I actually don't know what's, what Scratch, compiles or interprets into, do you know what, I mean, well, like, what's inside? I, I don't actually know, and they don't say. So, anyhow, it's 4.30. Thank you so much. Please, um, <laughs> please help.